Um, I am pumped to be here tonight. I know I know many of you, in case you don't, my name is Bo Landers. I'm one of the discipleship and teaching pastors up here. I get to help lead our Wednesday night service, among other things. And um, this, I will have you say, is a series that has been brewing, I feel like, with me for a really long time. And so I am excited to open uh, the book of Deuteronomy just over the next several weeks. And tonight, here's kind of my two-fold goal. Uh, partly we need to introduce the book, kind of what is the book of Deuteronomy, a book we don't often get to talk about much. How does it fit into the rest of Scripture? Uh, those kind of things. But then really what we want to drive to is give the purpose for why we should be reading it. Uh, why should we be reading uh, the book of Deuteronomy, uh, which is often a book that we don't necessarily kind of get to. We may classify it as the law. We may claim Paul's words in Galatians that those things need to be thrown out or something like that, uh, which is a mistranslation of those. But whatever it might be, uh, we may have our reasons. But I, I, hopefully we leave tonight with that, with a better understanding of kind of a, as we approach the book of Deuteronomy, but also that uh, the book of Deuteronomy is incredibly important. And we're going to be primarily looking at the first four chapters and so we're going to kind of take this by chunks um, as we go through this series, because we can't necessarily go verse by verse. Um, but by chunks, I think we'll have a really good overview and understanding of what's going on. Just to kind of explain the purpose and importance, where I want to, where I want to begin is I, I kind of want to put into perspective the importance of the book of Deuteronomy by looking at the life and ministry of Jesus. Uh, what we sometimes I think we forget is that when we think of Jesus and sort of the Bible that he was using, um, we forget that Romans was not in that Bible, <laughs> right? We forget maybe that Revelation was not in that Bible. In fact, none of the Gospels were in the Bible that Jesus was using while he was doing his life and ministry on earth. And so really, what was the Bible that Jesus was using? That was primarily the Old Testament, and so one case study that I kind of want to look at very briefly in our introduction is though he never read the book of Romans, though he never read the book of Revelation, he was clearly equipped with God's word against the attacks of the enemy. And so in Matthew chapter 4 is one of these examples, and you don't have to necessarily turn there. I'm going to kind of summarize what's going on right before Jesus enters into his ministry, right before Jesus kind of enters into the full swing of what we know of as Jesus doing all of his works. Um, he goes out in the wilderness to, uh, to pray and to fast and ultimately to be tempted by Satan. And what's interesting in Matthew chapter 4 is so Jesus goes into the wilderness to, and, and is tempted by Satan, and there are three temptations that take place. And what I want to do is I kind of want to go over the temptation, and then I, wanna, I want you to hear Jesus' response. Satan says this in the first temptation, that if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. So you got to think he's been fasting for 40 days. He's been doing this whole thing of uh, obviously not eating, not drinking water, all, uh, whatever, all that's included in this. And Satan, of course, comes up, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus' response, if you remember it, says, man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. He then follows that up, and you see Satan in his second temptation. He goes, well, if you're the son of God, then throw yourself down from atop this, this temple. And then he sort of misuses Psalm 91 as a proof text uh, to defend his case. Satan does that. And Jesus comes back, and he says, do not test the Lord your God. The third temptation, uh, he shows him all the kingdoms of the world, and he says, I will give you all of this if you bow down and worship me. And if you remember Jesus' response, he says, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Now, we think of Jesus's responses as being good answers to, to the enemy, uh, but what we uh, maybe not know is that each of those is a passage in Deuteronomy, and so most likely as Jesus is out in the wilderness, he is meditating on the words of Moses in the book of Deuteronomy. In fact, when he says, man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord, that's Deuteronomy 8 verse 3. When he says that, do not test the Lord your God, that is Deuteronomy 6, 16. And when then when he says, worship the Lord your God and serve only him, that's Deuteronomy 6, 13. So when we think of what Jesus was using as his Bible and defense against the enemy as well to continue and proclaim his ministry, ultimately what he ends up fulfilling in his work, the what he points back to is this book among others in the Old Testament canon. And so just to maybe a little bit broader perspective, in the New Testament, the book of Deuteronomy is quoted or at least alluded to over a hundred times. And so it becomes important for us to kind of peel back the layers and go, well, then why maybe aren't we reading it? Why aren't we sort of unpacking what's, what's happening here? Because clearly it was important to Jesus. Jesus. 
Clearly, it was important to the New Testament writers. So the question becomes is, is it important for us? Is it important for us as we try and live the life that God has called us to? With that sort of lingering in our mind, um, maybe I should ask the question of why should it be important to us? Let me offer maybe something slightly different. In 1774, two years prior to the Declaration of Independence, the Continental Congress was formed. And in order to bring some kind of organization and set some ground rules for the people living in this new land, they began to develop some semblance of government with the Continental Congress in 1774. So you remember the Declaration of Independence was signed just two years later. Just shortly after the Declaration of Independence was signed, they, they started realizing, our fa founding fathers started realizing, hey, this uh, Continental Congress isn't going to cut it. So they opted for uh, sort of uh, 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 Tribe B in 1777. And, and in light of the, their declared appendance, uh, independence, the Articles of Confederation was then proposed and then accepted just a few years later as a second option as a form of organized uh, sort of a, as a governing document. And then if you know our American history, um, just uh, a few years later, uh, about a decade later, a third governing document was then created and adopted, and that's what we know of as our Constitution. Here's what I want to kind of focus on with that little bit of a timeline. Since the founding of this land and even before the Declaration of Independence, our forefathers knew that in order to be the United States of America, we would need to lay down some basic governing ground rules that would give people the greatest opportunity for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, or as the preamble of the Constitution states, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general warfare, and secure the blessings and liberty to ourselves and our prosperity, do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. Now, yesterday, we celebrated uh, the 232nd anniversary of the signing of the Constitution. And we know of this as what we call Constitution Day. Uh, anybody know the other day that comes right in conjunction with Constitution Day? Citizenship Day. Now, it's interesting. So this happened just yesterday, the 232nd anniversary of the Constitution Day. And we got to kind of ask, why do they pair those two things together? See, our government says that when we, we are not only to remember the signing and celebrate uh, the signing of the Constitution, we're also to celebrate all of those who have attained American citizenship by submitting to that constitutional order. And I, I would say it's not an accident that these two holidays have been paired together. And truthfully, when you are a citizen of the United States, you live under the binding contract of that Constitution. That's what you get to do. Now, I, I want to be very clear. This is not a patriotic sermon. That's not at all where I'm going. But what I want you to understand is that as United States citizens, most of us are in this room, we fall under the Constitution. When we get to the book of Deuteronomy, the Deuteronomy, as best uh, as sort of an analogy that we can, we can present, is the book of Deuteronomy is Israel's Constitution. It is their contract by God as they are about to enter into the promised land. And so the difference, though, clearly there are some big differences. While we are proud to be Americans governed by this Constitution, we should celebrate ours and others' citizenship. Clearly, the Constitution that we have was created by broken and sinful men in need of Jesus. Further, the Constitution did not have the Holy Spirit as its author. And further, and the Constitution fails to live up to fully God's standard. We know that because we argue about it all the time. But what we know about the book of Deuteronomy, in contrast, is that it aligns with, say, a passage like 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, that it is still useful for teaching, for rebuke, for correction and training in righteousness, so that the person of God may be equipped to do the work that he, has been, he or she has been called to do. And so my, my thing is that if we get excited about the Constitution and those folks who live under that rule, how much more should we be excited about being a citizen of God's kingdom and living under his perfect reign? How much more should we cherish and meditate on these words in this Constitution for Israel? How much more should we learn the, the, the God who penned these words? How much more should we look to these words to teach us and to rebuke us and to correct us and to train us in righteousness? How much more should we see these words that Jesus so cherished? 
And that's the only parallel that we need to begin creating. Because as we open sort of this message today and what will come in the following weeks, our title for this, this teaching is God's People Under God's Contract. That's sort of the name for this series. God's People Under God's Contract or God's People Under God's Constitution, so to speak. I was hesitant to use the word constitution because I thought people might be ta- thinking it's going a different way. But, but God's people under God's contract. And so uh, just kind of as we approach the book of Deuteronomy, basically this is the nation of Israel's contract between them and God as they are about to enter the promised land. So some of our time today, I'm gonna, we're going to kind of briefly run over Israel's history, but it's going to build to this point of why does this book still matter for me? And then further, so they are a collection of Moses' final sermons to his people. So Moses has led these people all the way up. They're on the brink of entering the land that God has promised him. And these are sort of a collection of his final sermons before he dies and before they enter the land. Now, Deuteronomy, the name actually comes from the Greek translation of the Old Testament, uh, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which literally means the second law or uh, better probably translated as the reiteration of the law. So if you kind of put your Old Testament caps back on, the the original time that the Ten Commandments were given was in Exodus chapter 20. And so now we're getting this, we get a reiteration, and we're going to actually look at this next week. We're going to look at the Ten Commandments when they're given again in Deuteronomy chapter 5. And so this is a reiteration of the law, a sort of a re-emphasis on what God had already told them and called them to be. And so um, if you also remember again, once they left Egypt, they were headed to this promised land that God had promised them. They were on the brink of entering that the first time. And if you remember, they look and they're like, oh, we're like grasshoppers to these people. And they don't step in. They disobey God. And as a product, they, they wander around in the wilderness for 40 years. After that 40-year period, this is what we're picking up in Deuteronomy. It's like year 38, 39, and they're, again, approaching this land again, going, hey, let's not forget what happened in that first generation, that they didn't trust God, and let's remember where we're going with this. That first generation, they had the law, and so now Moses is sort of re-implementing and reiterating this law, and they're entering again. So basically, this is God's people and they were to live under God's reign, and here's how they should do it, becomes the book of Deuteronomy. Tonight, I want to specifically focus on this idea that of God's holiness and the holiness of God's people. And what I hope to do, again, is to sort of paint this, where are we in Scripture? But then further, what, what, how does the book of Deuteronomy help us understand our holy God? What is this holiness idea? And further, what does that mean then for us? if we are still God's people. And so we'll be looking at Deuteronomy 1 through 4, looking at these three ideas, that our God is holy, that God has called his people to be holy, and then we'll look at three ways of why why should God's people begin to pursue holiness. That God is holy, that God has called his people to be holy, and then three ways that why we should begin to pursue holiness ourselves. Look at, look at that first idea, that our God is holy. And this is where we'll begin to um, unpack what's going on in Deuteronomy. But that our God is holy. This will help us uh, go through the rest of the book. I guess to be, before we even begin, what, is it, what do we actually mean by this word holy? Now, from Greek and Hebrew alike, the word literally means to be set apart, to be sort of of a different substance. When I used to uh, teach this to uh, students, um, one, of my, uh, one of my key kind of illustrations was, have you ever tried to mix oil and water, right? No matter how hard you shake, no matter what happens, they're eventually going to separate out. Why? Because they're of a completely different substance. And so the illustration that we would do is I would food color the water to the exact same as the oil, and yet it would still, what would happen? They would still separate out. Why? Because again, they're a different substance. When we think of a holy God, we have to think that he is something different, of a completely different sort of substance and idea in his character and his nature than anything that we've ever come across. Okay, that's what we begin to say when we're saying our God is holy, that he is truly set apart. Maybe it's better said this way, that there is no one or no thing like our God. And so it's set up, truthfully, in this context, it's set up against all of the other little g gods, that he is this great I am. And so how do we begin to know that? And this is where Moses is sort of imploring. This is where we see this throughout the Old Testament, that he says, here's how you know that God is different. Here's how you know that God is holy. Go look at what he has done. 
Go look at what he has done and compare that to anything else. So how do we see that in the first few chapters of Deuteronomy? See, these chapters begin by addressing how they got to this point to remind them of God and remind them of their past failures so that they would not do that again. And so let's back up real quick, and I want to give a brief rundown of where we, how we get to Deuteronomy, and then we'll begin to look at chapter 1. So God creates. I'm going to start there, but I'm, I promise I'll go fast, okay? So God creates. He says it's good. This is great. And he creates Adam and Eve, and he says it's good. Then obviously sin enters the world, and the largest thing, the greatest thing that happens in that is what? Is that God and man can no longer dwell, dwell with one another. Because God is holy, he is different, he's of a different substance, he is perfect, in him there is no darkness, and now that sin has entered the world, they cannot have a relationship any longer. So then when sin enters the world, we see sin sort of left unchecked with Cain and Abel, we see the flood with Noah, and then it sort of peaks in the Tower of Babel, up through Genesis chapter 11. So then in Genesis chapter 12, God says, okay, clearly if left up to your own devices, evil is all throughout you. So let's try something a little different. God then says, not that he's having these revelations, he's proving his point. He comes in in Genesis chapter 12 and he establishes a covenant with Abraham. And he says, look, Abraham, I'm, I'm gonna pick you out, not because of anything you've done, but because of who I am as your God. And these are the three things that I'll promise you. I'll promise you land, which when we talk about the promised land, this is the idea that's coming to mind. I'll promise you land. I'll promise you seed, which are descendants. Uh, basically, you'll continue to multiply you become a great nation, I promise you land, I promise you seed, and I promise you blessing, that I will continue to be your God, and I will continue to bless you, even if you rebel, because I am God and you are not. And so these three things are what happened in Genesis chapter 12. Through the rest of the book of Genesis, this is the unfolding, right? So you have Abraham who has Isaac, Isaac who has Jacob, Jacob who has his 12 sons. Those 12 sons are sort of the precursor to the 12 tribes of Israel that are going to come eventually. And then you know that they end up in Egypt by God's providence over Joseph's life. And then they get put under Egyptian captivity by the time we open the book of Exodus. Under Egyptian captivity, they're still growing. God is still promising them blessing, still promising them descendants. What don't they have though? They don't have land, not yet. But God is still growing them into a nation, and God is still blessing them because he is still their God, even though they're under this captivity. And so Moses delivers this nation from captivity, and they head to this promised land. They have the blessing. They've grown into a nation, and now they're headed to the promised land initially right after the exodus. Remember the plagues and the, the parting of the Red Sea, and then the whole manna incident, and they're complaining, and that, then they get to the brink. Right, And so the, the first few chapters of the book of Deuteronomy, I say all this because the first few chapters of the book of Deuteronomy are recounting and replaying sort of what comes next in these events. Moses is looking at the end of his life, having experienced all that he did in Egypt, all that God did and that Moses was kind of a part of. And he's looking back at those going, hey, let's, let's just take a, take a pause real quick before we enter here and let's remember what has happened. And so to, let's listen real quick. I'm going to throw several passages on the screen coming out of uh, these first few chapters. But um, I, I want to hear how Moses is recounting this story to the Israelites as they're getting ready to go to this promised land, the thing that had been promised to Abraham way back in Genesis chapter 12. And so as they were approaching the promised land the first time, Moses reminds the people, look at Deuteronomy 1.8 right here. Okay, so he begins to recount, and he recounts the first time that they came to the promised land. And here's what he says. See, I have set the land before you. Enter and take possession of the land. The Lord swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their future descendants. Now let's pause there for just a second, okay? So anytime you see in the Old Testament, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it's calling us back to the covenant relationship that God made in Genesis chapter 12, saying, I've been faithful all along. I don't know where you've been. Actually, I do know where you've been. It hasn't really been that great. And so he's calling us back to this point of saying, remember who this God is. And so as they're approaching the promised land, Moses reminds them, look, God's been faithful. Let's be faithful. Let's go take the land like we're supposed to. He's reminding them of the covenantal God, this relational God, this relational God that's different, again, holy, than all of the other gods. So Moses retells their story, and he reminds them of the first time that they came to the promised land. Yet despite all that God had done, look at verse, uh, we'll skip down to verse 26 and 27 of chapter 1 in Deuteronomy. So Moses is retelling, and this is what he says. But, <laughs> so there, there's a good start, but you were not willing to go up 
You rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. You grumbled in your tents and said, the Lord brought us out of the land of Egypt to hand us over to the Amorites in order to destroy us because he hates us. What's Moses doing? He's recounting. He's saying, look, we had it. We were going to go to the promised land. We were going to remember the covenant God said. And then what do we do? No, you guys started getting scared. Then uh, pick, pick back up. Then Moses reminds them in 29. Uh, begins to remind them. So then he counters Israel's sort of pushback against going into the promised land. He says this, So I said to you, don't be terrified or afraid. The Lord your God who goes before you will fight for you, just as you saw him do in Egypt. And you saw in the wilderness how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son all along the way you traveled until you reached this place. I love that passage. Think of the sort of God Right? I have a four-year-old son and a three-year-old son. We're, about, we're expecting our third, and this one's going to be a little girl. And I'm sure as these little boys start to play sports, what am I going to be doing? I'm going to be toting that little one around everywhere I go. And where's that little one going? Wherever she is on my hip. This is the idea. God, he's saying, look, you guys didn't even do anything. You guys were carried here by this God. This is the sort of God. This is the, this is the sort of God who we serve. That's what Moses is reminding them as they push back. But then they don't listen. Look at verse 32 of chapter 1. But in spite of this, you did not trust the Lord your God who went before you on the journey. So he went before you on the journey. Like you're seeing the language here. He went before you on the journey to seek out a place for you to camp. He went in the fire by night and in the cloud by day. This is talking about the the very presence of God was among them in the fire and in the cloud by day on the road to where you travel. And when the Lord heard your words, he grew angry and swore an oath. None of these men in this evil generation will see the good land I swore to give your fathers. He's recounting that first generation. They had the land. They had this dialogue back and forth of Moses sort of intermediating between God and the people, and they end up listening to the people. And as a result, this generation will not enter the land that had been promised to them. So if you remember the story and after the curse, they tried, right after this curse happened, they tried to go and, and uh, go up and fight and take the land without God's help. And if you remember the story, that doesn't go well. It never goes well to try and fight without the Lord. Um, And so uh, other things that happen sort of as we summarize chapter two and three of Deuteronomy, uh, Moses just continues to remind them. We see God's holiness on display as they have to go and um, as they have to go by Esau's descendants. We see God's holiness again on display as they waited for the first generation to die. And then we see God's holiness in the beginning to give Israel the land. And it is God who gives them uh, gives the Israel the victory. And look at verse 25 of chapter 2. It says, Today I will begin. So now God, as sort of as this first generation has passed, they're getting ready. God is, uh, Moses is sort of reminding them, hey, let me tell you the kind of God, not only is he the kind of God that carries you on his hip, he's going before you and doing this. Verse 25, Today I will begin to put the fear and dread of you on the peoples everywhere under heaven. And they will hear the report about you tremble and be in anguish because of you. I don't know if you've ever played sports, right, or anything like that. But if you go before someone and you begin to intimidate them and taunt them, that, that's, a, that's a psychological thing to where that helps you ultimately in the game. Sometimes it hurts, yes, but that's because you're not good at it. If you're good at it and the Lord is the best at it, he's going before Israel and what's he doing? taunting them, saying, Israel will defeat you. And now they're scared even before they've even entered in or stepped in or had a battle in the promised land. Of course, after over and over again, God is displaying his holiness, his otherness to Israel, that God is different than any other God in might, in power, in goodness, in love, in faithfulness. And then what is his charge to the second generation? as they enter into this land. Look at Deuteronomy 4, 32 through 40. This is uh, what, what we began with during our time of worship. Indeed, ask about the earlier days that preceded you from the day God created. So now he's looking, Moses is looking at these people and he's, he's saying, look, from the day God created mankind in the earth from, uh, and from one end of the heavens to the other, now he's just questioning them. These rhetorical questions that clearly God is different than any other God that is out there. Has anything like this great event ever happened? Or has anything like it been heard of? Has a people heard God's voice speaking from fire as you have and lived? Or has God attempted 
to go and take a nation as his own out of, any, uh, out of another nation by trials, signs, wonders, and war, by a strong hand and an outstretched arm, by great terrors as the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes. You were shown these things so that you would know that the Lord is God and there is no other besides him. And he let you hear his voice from heaven to instruct you. He showed you his great fire on the earth and you heard his words from the fire. Let me just pause there as we'll keep reading. But if we begin to see this as believers, how many of you think your faith at this point would be strengthened and bolstered having seen all of these things? And this is what Moses is reminding him. You've seen all of this. Keep going in verse 37. Because he loved your fathers, he chose their... Um, he chose their descendants after them and brought you out of Egypt by his presence and great power to drive out before you the nations greater and stronger than you and to bring you in and give you their land as an inheritance as is now taking place. Today, recognize and keep in mind that the Lord is God in heaven and above and on the earth below. There is no other. Keep his statutes and commands, which I am giving you today so that you and your children after you may prosper and so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you for all time. What is Moses doing? He's reminding them over and over again that God is holy, and he has been with you all along. And here's what I want to remind us through this. We serve that same God, and we need to remember that. I understand that sometimes we begin to paint this picture of a God of the Old Testament versus a God of the New Testament, but that is a false dichotomy. That is a false misrepresentation of our God. He is consistent through the age, ages. He doesn't change. If anything, we change. He is the spotless, without, spotless one without blemish, perfect and without defect, glorious and without darkness. And though we might paint two different pictures of God, we're going to see over and over again in Deuteronomy that he is consistent to his character and that he is holy and set apart and different from all other gods. The first thing that we have to do is to understand the need for Deuteronomy is not only sort of the context and entering this land, but understand what it means to have a God like our God. That's what we need to understand. That what does it mean to have a God like our God? That God sets up a constitution, so to speak, that models his holiness. Let's look at the second point, that God has called his people to be holy. Not only is God holy, but now he is looking at his people, the nation of Israel, and he's saying, you also are to be holy. You're to be this kind of different type of person, the kind that is set apart, the oil versus water scenario. The world may be water, but you are oil. You're something of a different substance. Israel was supposed to be God's people. I want to, I want to harken back, kind of look back to Exodus chapter 19. I feel like this is Israel's purpose statement. Um, as we see them coming out just right after this is when we get the first time the Ten Commandments are given. So it kind of says, before we even get the Ten Commandments, who is Israel supposed to be? Look at Exodus 19, 4 and 6 on the screen. It says, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I carried you on, e on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you will, carefully listen to me and keep my covenant, you will, and here it is, who is Israel supposed to be? You will be my own possession out of all the peoples, although the whole earth is mine. And you will be my kingdom of priests and my what? Holy nation. That nation that is set apart from all of the other nations. See, Israel had the call to reflect God's holiness. That they would be their, his own possession, a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. And here's what I want you to say. Well, that's them in the Old Testament. We're not the nation of Israel. Look at 1 Peter. Uh, first, let's look at chapter 1, 15 through 16. Does the call change from Old to New Testament? 1 Peter chapter 1, 15 and 16. But as the one who has called you is holy, you are also to what? Be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. You know what that's coming from? Leviticus 11, Leviticus 19, and Leviticus 20. In the law. And what is Peter doing? He's using that saying, God is holy and you need to be and mimic that same sort of holiness. But let me just give it to you one further. Look at 1 Peter just one chapter later in chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. Listen to the language here and listen to how similar it is to Exodus chapter 19. But you are looking, Peter is looking at the church. He's looking at believers who have called upon the name of the Lord Jesus to be saved. And what does he call them? You are a what? A chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. What is he doing? That's Exodus 19. Exodus 19. 
When you are God's people, your purpose has not changed. God is holy, and you also are supposed to be holy and set apart and different from all of the other nations. I get it. We, in the New Testament, we can focus on two different maybe kinds of holiness. We can talk about positional holiness, that, that a God is over here, that I am over here, and there is a chasm between us. And what Christ does is he stands in our stead. God looks through Christ to us, and we are clothed with his righteousness and his holiness to where positionally now between us and God, we are deemed holy and we are saved. Absolutely. That is the gospel. And if you don't know that, it's not about your works. It's about everything that Christ has done. That's the gospel. And that's the good news that you don't have to bring anything to the table to be positionally holy before the Lord. But what we also need to begin thinking through is this idea of what then is pursuing holiness. We may be positionally holy, but then how do we pursue this holiness? How do we end up looking like Jesus more and more in our life? That's what we're called to as believers. Not because it changes our position as far as salvation is concerned, but, and what we'll see later is why then do we need to pursue this holiness, but because this holiness is a life that we are called to as believers. So then what does this mean for the book of Deuteronomy? That we still serve a holy God and we are still called to be a holy people. And on this side of the cross of Jesus, here's what Deuteronomy can still do for us. It can teach us. It can rebuke us, it can correct us, and it can train us to be what we have called to be, which is holy. That's what Deuteronomy can do for us. So why do we, why do we need to be holy? Why should God's people pursue holiness? Just in these last few minutes, I want to look at Deuteronomy chapter 4 in particular, and I want to look at three ways, that, uh, I, I, three reasons that come out of Deuteronomy 4 for why we should be pursuing this holiness. Because if we are positionally holy, why do we need to pursue holiness? And this is where Deuteronomy is helpful. The law was never meant to bring life. It was never meant to bring salvation. It always exposed sin and then left people in need of God's grace that would ultimately be fulfilled in Christ. But Israel's obedience to Deuteronomy, basically Israel's obedience to their constitution, was directly tied to their call to be holy, to be set apart. So let's look at three reasons from Deuteronomy chapter 4 that we can see of why should God's people pursue holiness. First is uh, we have the, uh, because it positions us as having a right respect for God. In the good uh, sort of subtle Baptist way, all of these will start with R, so maybe that'll be helpful. But right respect for God. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 4, 23 and 24. 23 and 24. It says, be careful not to forget the covenant of the Lord your God that he made with you and make an idol for yourselves in the shape of anything he has forbidden you. Now catch verse 24. For the Lord your God is a what? A consuming fire, a jealous God. So the first question is, why should we pursue holiness? If we're positionally holy by Christ and what he has done for us, why should we continue to keep trying to look more like this Christ? Well, according to Deuteronomy, when we pursue holiness, we learn how to properly respect our Lord. We learn how to fear him, so to speak. We learn how to worship him. That's the idea of respect here. We learn him to put him on the throne and take us off the throne as we pursue this holiness. So if we kind of look at the passage right here, this idea for the Lord your God is a consuming fire. At one point, it should draw us back to sort of like an Exodus chapter 3. If you remember in Exodus 3, that's when Moses encounters the burning bush. The same sort of language is being used, this consuming fire, except for the bush is not being consumed, right? And so in some ways, this consuming fire is pointing us back to God's presence, that God is present among you, yet at the same time, it's taking it a step further and saying not only is it God's presence, it's also this burning fury in the face of infidelity. And I say infidelity because if we're talking about a covenant and a contract, someone who has been unfaithful to that contract, it is God sort of uh, coming back. Not only is God present, but it's his burning fury in the face of that. And then you see that he is a jealous God. Now, some people have gotten hung up on what does it mean to be jealous because we typically hear of jealousy in a negative context. Here, this term usually speaks uh, of the legitimate passion that is aroused when interference from a third party threatens a proper relationship, like particularly like a marriage relationship when another lover enters the picture. 
right? That's the sort of jealousy that we're beginning to see, that Yahweh is an impassioned God who treasures Israel as his covenantal people, and the love, this love is fueled not by sort of this need to dominate, but by uh, being the object of their worship as he should be, because something else has taken that place. In our pursuit of looking more like God, we must remember just how holy God is. That's how we begin to give him the respect, the worship, and the fear that he deserves. It puts our holiness, so to speak, in perspective. Just think of it this way. We think we're fine until we measure up to the actual measuring stick. I can remember one time um, I went down south and we were building a house for someone. And, I was, and so I was the guy that did the shingles right? And so I'd never done shingles, but by the end of the week, I was a pretty good shingler, right? It was, it was super hot outside, which I, I, man, that's just a, that is a tough job. But I remember I had a, I had the air, air compressor gun and I would go, by the end of the week, I, was, I felt like I was really, really fast. I remember a couple of weeks later after leaving that trip and uh, I was watching a roof getting put up and there was this guy and he didn't have any air compression tools. He didn't have anything. And clearly he had done this before. And he gets up and if you've seen him, he had a pouch right here of nails and he was able to take it out and in one swoop with a hammer, just and, and he went and I'm watching him just and my wife says, hey, honey, you need to drive. And, and I'm watching him. And this whole thing's unfolding, and I'm quickly realizing I'm not that good, right? Because, because why? Because I'm comparing it, and I'm saying, okay, look, what I thought was good, and yes, I did get better. Now I'm seeing the standard of what it looks like to be an expert, and all of a sudden, it pales in comparison. Here's what happens as we begin to pursue holiness. When we actually consider the things that God is calling us to in our life, and we actually consider the God who is God, who is holy, who is perfect, what happens? All of a sudden, the good things that we think that we're doing in life, the things that we say, you know what, I can take a break from maybe uh, continuing to pursue him and just sort of coast along because I'm doing good enough. When God comes it back into the picture, all of a sudden, our righteous deeds become rags again. It puts it back into perspective. Our pursuit of holiness continually reminds us of the standard that has been set, the standard that we can't reach, and our continual need for Jesus. That's, that's what our holiness, our pursuit of holiness in part does. It shows us and reveals to us how, how great and holy our God actually is. Second, not only does it show us our, 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 our right respect uh, for God, it shows a re- right relationship with God. Why should we begin to pursue holiness? Because it gives us a right relationship with God. There's a large passage here, but I want to read it um, because it's important to follow what's kind of going on. As chapter 4 is finishing, here's what Moses says, beginning in verse 25. When you have children and grandchildren and have been in the land a long time, and if you act corruptly, make an idol in the form of anything, and do what is evil in the sight of the Lord, right? Uh, Which that is a phrase that continues over and over again throughout, say, the book of Judges, uh, the book of, uh, you know, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Chronicle. So we do evil in the sight of the Lord, angering him. I call, uh, I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you today. So you can see the trial type language that's happening against you today that you will quickly perish from the land you are about to cross, uh, to cross the Jordan to possess. You will not live there long. You will not live long there, but you will certainly be destroyed. The Lord will scatter you among the peoples and you will be reduced to a few survivors among the nations where the Lord your God will drive you. There you will worship man-made gods of wood and stone, which cannot see, hear, eat, or smell. What's he describing? What's going to happen to them? This is a prophecy. Moses is prophesying, hey, look, let me just tell you where your trajectory is going. Verse 29, though. But from there, you will search for the Lord your God, and you will find him when you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. That sounds a little bit like Jesus, right? When you are in distress and all these things have happened to you, in the future you will return to the Lord your God and obey him. He will not leave you, destroy you, or forget you, or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them by oath, because the Lord your God is a compassionate God. Why should we pursue holiness? To have a right relationship with God. Right? So if we unpack sort of what's happening there, Moses shifts and then begins foretelling what will happen in their future. And what happens? Their disobedience and their relationship with God, uh, with their disobedience, their relationship with God is directly impacted by their disobedience. 
So what can we learn from that? That in our life, we are either driving closer to God or pushing ourselves further away from God, and there is no middle ground. And Christ, calling upon in the name of the Lord Jesus to be saved, puts us positionally holy before God. And I want to be very careful, right? I don't want to say, I want to say that, that, that God's salvation is not conditional upon your actions. It's based purely upon the actions of Christ. That is our salvation in the gospel, that nothing can snatch us out of the hand. And we know this, but our pursuit of holiness and obedience to God draws us closer to God, allowing us to experience more of him, delighting in him, enjoying this God because our pursuit of holiness places us in a position to experience God and be used by God. In other words, I kind of want to make a distinction between our salvation and the get out of hell card and the flourishing that God is promising us in having a good relationship with him. Some Christians are miserable. They may, they may be saved, but they're living in a pursuit of themselves, and as a result, their life is like that of the scattered Israel. But God calls us to pursue him, and in doing so, we thrive and flourish as believers. And here's the good news. If maybe you're on a path where you have been sort of pushing away and your relationship with God isn't what it, what, it, what it should be, according to the scriptures. You know you're saved, but that's where you've been walking. Guess what happened in verse 29? God welcomes you back. Again, the false dichotomy of presenting a God in the Old Testament who's not forgiving and full of grace is just not in the scriptures. What is God doing? He's welcoming them back. When they do what? They begin to pursue the holiness again. Right? Because we're not talking salvation, we're talking flourishing even at this point. This has always been God's heart. He wants a right relationship with us. Last one. Further, and sort of the last point, is that when we pursue holiness, we develop a right representation of God. A right representation of God. Verse 5 of chapter 4. Look, I've taught you statutes and ordinances as the Lord my God has commanded me, so that you may follow them in the land you are entering to possess. Carefully follow them, for this will show, here's, here's the key, this following will show your wisdom and understanding in the eyes of the peoples. When they hear about all the statutes, they will say, this great nation, so all these other nations are now looking at Israel saying, this great nation is indeed a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has, has a God near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call to him? And what great nation has righteous statutes and ordinances like this entire law I set before you today? Why do we pursue holiness? Part of its respect, part of its relationship, but then it's also part of it is representation. What happens when we pursue holiness is that we represent the God who is holy to all other peoples. What are we called to be? Remember 1 Peter 2, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, people for his possession. And in the last part of 1 uh, 1 Peter, it says, so that, here's why you were called, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you from darkness into his light misconception of the Old Testament God is that somehow that all of God's love is directed only for Israel. But what we miss is that it was directed for Israel for the purpose of that every other nation would see that God, their God, is different than all the other gods because in this love that Yahweh has for Israel, it is a covenantal, relational, grace-filled, mercy-filled kind of love. And that as they do what God has called them to do, they would be good representations of that holy God. So as we close, God has called us to holiness, and the book of Deuteronomy sheds light on the holiness God wants from his people. The book of Deuteronomy can teach us, it can rebuke us, it can correct us, and it can train us for righteousness. And in many ways, through this contract and sort of constitution that we read in Deuteronomy, God is displaying his holiness. And he's calling his people to this same sort of holiness so that we may have a right respect of him, so that they may have, uh, we may have a right relationship with him, and we might represent him well. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for uh, just this easy step into Deuteronomy. Lord, I pray over the next several weeks that you be present and that you be praised in our time together. It's in your son Jesus' name we do pray. Amen and amen.